good afternoon. Good morning to, uh, to anybody in uh, at those time zones, or good evening to those. Uh, greetings to you from uh, Kruger National Park in the eastern part of South Africa, where I'm fortunate enough to be hiding out from the, the third uh, COVID wave uh, in, in uh, Pretoria and Johannesburg. Um, but where I'm also fortunate enough to be able to bring, uh, to moderate today's panel discussion on unlocking commercial finance for water and sanitation. My name is Chris Serjak, and I'm a member of the Rock Blue team. And I'm proud to be part of uh, Rock Blue, which is an international NGO focused on empowering water and sanitation utilities to create healthy cities and improve people's lives. For more information, please check out our website at rockblue.org. As you all know, uh, investments in water and sanitation are essential to reaching the Sustainable Development Goal 6 uh, objectives. Commercial finance, uh, such as bank loans, are an important option to help close the capital gap for water service providers allowing them to accelerate investments in water and sanitation uh, delivery and expand their coverage. But water and sanitation utilities in the developing countries have historically struggled to access commercial finance. And over the next two hours, our panel of WASH finance experts are going to discuss the different forms of commercial finance, the challenges with, uh, with associated with obtaining this type of funding, excuse me, and hope to offer realistic solutions to overcoming those obstacles. I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed panel today, representing some of the best known names in WASH finance. First off, we have Joel Kolker, who is the program manager of the World Bank's Global Water Security and Sanitation Partnership. We have Dr. Jeremy Gorlick, who is head of, head of special initiatives of Green Finance Institute, head of origination for a WASH-focused impact investment fund and an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University. Gregor Landell is the founder of City Taps, an organization with partners with water utilities to help them improve their cash flows and balance sheets. And Rich Thorsten is chief insights officer at water.org and is acting as the interim lead for their water supply and sanitation global practice. Over this uh, session, I'll be asking each of the panelists a few questions and encouraging them to engage with each other on the answers. And in some cases, we hope we might, might even see some argument or some disagreement and some real meaningful interchange. If you have any questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please use the chat function uh, for any technical issues. So don't put any questions in the chat. We ask you to do that because the Q&A function records your questions. And if we can't get them to them at the end of this panel session, uh, our specialists, our panelists have committed to helping respond to all of those uh, in writing, which will be posted along with a recording of today's session on the rockblue.org website within, a, within about two weeks time. If there's no questions about the format of today's event, I'd like to ask the president of Rock Blue, Mr. Peter Macy, to give some opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chris. And on behalf of Rock Blue, I wanna welcome our talented and highly accomplished panelists, as well as all the attendees for today. Uh, just so you know, we've had over 400 registrants, uh, which is quite a lot for this, this series. Um, and it's a testament to panelists that we have and the acute interest in this particular subject matter on finance. Um, so anyway, I, I wish everyone a, a wonderful panel discussion, a great learning event, and um, I'll hand it back over to you, Chris. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I'm thrilled to see uh, on the participant list uh, several familiar names as well as, uh, as names new to me. So I'm, glad, I'm thrilled to see how our, our outreach has worked and uh, the, the participation is coming from here. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hearing from our, our panel today. 
So with no further ado, I'd like to kick off with a question to, uh, to Joel. Joel, do you have any recent relatable examples of utilities or municipalities in Southern Africa or elsewhere in the developing world who have successfully financed a water sanitation project? How do they manage to secure this uh, commercial or repayable finance? Okay, thanks. And thanks to Rob Blue and my other colleagues for participating in this uh, very, very important um, meeting. Look, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, recent examples are in Benin, Uganda, South Africa, Rwanda, Kenya. Um, but I think the, the main point is how do you get there, right? I mean, that was the result of quite a bit of work. And I think the, the foundation of this conversation today has to be around efficiency because you cannot secure financing public or one of the things we learned from COVID is you can't even get public money if you're not efficient. Um, but the key to commercial financing is uh, efficiency. And to get to efficiency in terms of water service providers, there's two foundational issues. And many of you heard me say this before, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it's absolutely essential. The first is the technical and financial efficiency and viability of your operations. If you are only collecting 60% of your revenue or your water losses are 40%, you are not gonna be efficient. That's number one. Number two is the governance, institutional and regulatory arrangements have to be uh, vibrant and transparent. You're not gonna be able to attract uh, financial um, commitments to the sector if that institutional arrangement is continuously undermined. With those two points, the technical and financial viability and the governance institutional and regulatory arrangements being clear and transparent and viable, then you can start getting to efficiency and then you can start getting to credit worthiness. So in the global setting, um, you see most of the OECD countries are actually financing all their large scale water infrastructure with long term finance provided by, um, by the private sector, pension funds and insurance companies in particular. You can get later into the different kinds of financing, but this is viable. It's happening around the world uh, and it's certainly happening in Africa. And the way to get there is more efficiency in our operations, more transparency in our governance arrangements which leads to credit worthiness. And then we can start talking about how to get that, how to get those resources. But these two points are absolutely foundational. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. And I think we'll be unpacking uh, those a little bit more as we go through these other questions. Gregoire, I understand City uh, I just signed a deal with, uh, I believe it's Beaumet Water, uh, that is self-financed with a private investor. Are there lessons learned from that that uh, maybe reflect what Joel's talked about and, uh, and that would be applicable here? All right, thank you. Uh, so it's Bomet, uh, Bomet, Bomet Water and Sanitation uh, Company. And I wanna tip my hat to any of them that might be listening uh, today because uh, yes, they, we have in fact secured a deal which both uh, agrees with what Joel just said and sort of offends what he just said uh, in the sense that uh, it's a very small deal. Uh, it's for about, uh, you know, 100,000 euros. So it's not, I'm not talking about the sort of millions of euros that you need or millions of dollars that you need to, to provide, uh, you know, treatment plants, and pipes and water towers and the sort of integrated uh, network. So it's a very small project. Uh, it's too small for uh, most investors to be interested in, but it, it is being done irrelevant, uh, irreg irregarding of whether, um, by disregarding whether the utility itself is, is credit worthy. Okay. And the key learning from that is that we have used City Taps as technology, unique technology, which is a smart and pay as you go water meter. So slightly more sophisticated than prepaid meter, a pay-as-you-go meter that is also smart. And the revenue generated by Bomet Water 
through these individual smart paygo meters is used to guarantee the repayment to the water to the investor. So the investor has been able to ignore the fact that Bomet is or is not credit worthy because there is a ring fencing that's happening around the project itself and the revenue generated by the very thing that the investor is financing is being used to pay back the investor. Now this works because all the payments are digital. They're used using M-Pesa, this is in Kenya. So uh, it's you know mobile money payments, which means there can be no room for the money to evaporate in between the moment when it's collected from the subscribers and the moment that it's paid back to the investor, right? And so that provides a measure of security and safety and basically eliminates the counterparty risk of the utility. And so it makes it very safe for the investor to lend to Bomet Water. Again, without really having to worry about whether or not Bomet Water itself is credit worthy. But it is very important that Bomet Water is efficient, that there is water flowing through those pipes, that people are going to be consuming water, that the technical team is capable, and even more importantly, that the general manager of Bomet Water is fundamentally invested in this project, and I believe that he is, it happens to be a he. And, you know, and so those are the lessons learned, is that for small-scale projects like the one that we're dealing with, which are a stepping stone, and only a stepping stone towards overall credit worthiness, there is a way to sort of short circuit, you know, the, 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 the progress and make sure that we deploy technology that's going to allow the utility to be paying in advance, recover any arrears that it has outstanding, and reconnect any disconnected customers, all the while repaying its investors. So this is, this is a new kind of deal. It's not suited to financing a, a wastewater treatment plant or drinking water treatment plant. We're not at that scale yet. But in the long term, what we're really interested in at City Taps is how can technology be a tool that can enable the credit, the, 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 the commercial set, uh, finance sector to invest in water utilities and reduce its, the counterparty risk so that it's willing to do what's necessary to reach SDG 6. I mean, it was, it was um, Jennifer Sarah that said, you know, when I heard her in 2019, she said, we're never gonna have enough money for this, right? It's gonna cost $114 billion a year to reach SG6 and the World Bank doesn't have that much money. So we need to go to the world, to the commercial sector to do that. And so that's why we're, that's why we're, we're doing what we're doing. And that we believe Bomet is, is a really an important first step in the right direction. Yeah. So, Chris, can I, I jump in with can I jump in with something yeah. just I know you want this to be interactive and, and so I go want ahead, to go ask, to uh, so Gregoire, I think that it's really interesting to hear the way that you you frame that and and since many of the people who are dialed in are representing utilities one of the things that that is I guess interesting but also potentially a challenge for some of them is where they can source money and I know that you and I for example have had conversations around how to impact investors get involved in mm -hmm. playing that role an impact investors might not be able to come in on, let's say, a utility that's looking for investment into capital projects and infrastructure, whereas your approach is one which is slightly different. Do you think that, that there's then different flavors of commercial finance or finance in general, payable finance, we need to be thinking about for a utility rather than for a service provider to a utility? Because I feel like those are two different types of animals. And I'm curious to know what you think on that. So, so the, thank you. That it's a really great question. Um, so, the the financing is going to the utility, and the utility is repaying the financier. City Tap sits at the other end of the triangle, providing the technology that smooths the rela the relationship between those two. Okay. So, just so you know, we are not the financier in this particular instance. Now, there could be cases where City Taps would finance a project on its own data. Uh, balance sheet should that balance sheet be strong enough right but we're also we're also exploring um opportunities with a number of other partners uh in kenya um uh, specifically with equity bank 
and I, in, I invited our, our contact there, so I hope he's listening, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to, to provide this kind of financing uh, to, the, uh, to the utilities and with a number of PE firms who have had experience in the solar pay-as-you-go field and who are interested in leveraging what they learned and our expertise in the water sector to sort of come up with you know, what are the risks and rewards and where are the differences so that the lessons that have been learned in pay-as-you-go solar can be applied for what is essentially pay-as-you-go water, but it's not, a, I mean, we can go into the weeds on this thing a little bit, but it's maybe too much detail. But the, the point is that, yes, there are several different kinds of investors going, ranging from banks to PE firms to our current contact who is um, untapped Kenya, which some people might know uh, in the audience, and those people have got an appetite for risk um, that differs, you know, banks versus untapped, for example. And so, you know, some people are willing to fund the first kinds of projects. Others are willing, are needing to wait a little bit and see that there is data coming out to show, the, to show that the uh, repayments are going to happen. And I'm happy to report that we have data to show that repayments, in fact, can happen. Right. Hey, Does that yeah, answer so I want to move on. What I hear, what I'm hearing from Joel and, and from Gregoire is, you know, there's basic fundamentals uh, that are necessary for mobilizing or accessing credit. And meanwhile, in parallel with that, there are these innovations that are that are kind of bridging that or hopefully accelerating uh, being able to achieve those fundamentals. So, uh, you know, let's uh, let's keep keep this conversation going. Uh, Jeremy, it's your chance. Um, Hey, and Gregor touched on this slightly, um, but why would my water service provider, my utility, want to borrow money and take on debt? Loans have to be repaid. You have to pay interest on the loan, so it ends up being more expensive than, I, than if I had just paid for it with my own, my own cash, my own revenues, or I can just use that to pay my salaries and other OPEX and then worry about grants and, uh, and the World Bank to fund my, uh, my CapEx expenditures. Why do I need to go through the trouble of, uh, of going out and getting uh, rejected by, by banks until one finally agrees to lend to me? Thanks, Chris. And thanks, everybody, for allowing me a chance to be on this panel. It's great to be able to share some of my experiences and hear from those of my panelists as well. Uh, it's a good question, and it's one that I've heard regularly, that, that utilities will say, why would I want to be taking on debt? Why do I want to take on that responsibility of needing to... to have better financial management and whatever else the case might be. I think that that COVID has changed the situation a little bit, but I would say even pre-COVID, there's a, a finite amount of money that's out there. And whether or not you're the best utility or the worst utility in the world, there aren't enough pots of money for you to be able to access where you can rely on the grant money that would be able to carry you through as far as capital investments are concerned. And so if you do not have that access to capital money as far as grants are concerned, then you do need to find other places to go. My argument would be that every utility needs to have a long-term capital investment plan. And again, whether you're the weakest or the strongest, you need to have a vision for what it is that you need money for today, tomorrow, five years, 10 years from now. And those investments are going to be ones that are predicated in some part on whether or not you have the ability to be able to show that you have strong financial management and whether or not your capital investment plan marries very nicely to everything else that you're thinking about from the perspective of where is the funding, what are the projects, what is the right sort of instrument. So if I'm a utility and I'm saying, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling to cover the shortfalls in my operating budget, it's a very different sort of a need than let's say your five to 10 year, your 20 year expectation as far as capital investment. So my argument to every utility would be, don't just plan for the fact that you, if you do have access to grants, you can't assume those grants will always be there. And you need to instead start to think about how you mature your own utility, whether you're the CEO, the CFO, anybody else who's responsible from a senior management perspective, or whether you're a junior engineer who has a vision of one day leading that utility, start thinking about how you can improve the service, improve everything else that's associated. It's not also as though just having access to finance means that you're exclusively focused on that capital investment picture of portfolio. You also are ultimately looking at what the financial health of the utility is, 
and as Joel said when he opened up with his comments, it's about that efficiency of the utility as well. I would argue that there's no utility that is able to access commercial finance that is not also blessed with the, the confidence to be able to go out to its customer base and say, we are doing a good job, because that also reflects on what the confidence everybody else has. Uh, so from my perspective, I think that, to sum up, I think that it would be irresponsible of any utility to not think about can we afford to borrow? Does it make sense? What does that borrowing look like? Because it helps to free up some of that cash from a long-term basis. Uh, I do think that many utilities think from a very short-term perspective and think that there needs to be some sort of a, a three to five-year plan as far as repayment of their long-term capital infrastructure needs. That's wrong. And I understand that many of the domestic commercial banks, especially those in Africa, will encourage that shorter-term vision but I think you need to push back. I think you need to start to say, we need to match the useful life of the assets to the financing that we're accessing. And unfortunately, many of those domestic commercial banks won't honor that. And that's why it's important for the role that DFIs play. Uh, so I, I know that there are a lot of other questions you wanna get to Chris. So I hope that that at least helped to frame some of these thinking. Thanks. No, absolutely. Now we've talked about the motivation. Now, uh, now let's talk about making it attractive. And it's, uh, your, your concluding remarks say, Jeremy, are a nice segue uh, for, uh, uh, for Rich. Hypothetically, in my country, my, my utility, the banks all charge unaffordable interest rates. How can I re ever repay the loan or make that affordable in my financial planning with such high rates? 13% in Kenya, 30% in Zambia, uh, in interest for every dollar invested. Uh, so that's, that's the first part of the question. You know, how, how is that affordable for me? Or how can we, how can we change that? On the, other, on the flip side of that, and this applies here, even here in South Africa, is I want to upgrade my reticulation network or some of my capital infrastructure. Um, and they ha the, that infrastructure have lifetimes, as Jeremy mentioned, of 30, 40, 50 years but the bank wants me to repay that in seven to 10 years. Wouldn't it be easier if I had a longer tenure on that loan, a longer repair payment period, and how can I access that? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Peter, for uh, having me. And it's, it's great to be here with you all. I've, I've been tracking some of the participants um, engaging in, in this event. I, I think some of those participants could probably also help to answer and address some of these questions too. So it's great to be uh, part of this audience. Um, so loan costs and loan tenure are you know, two important considerations for utilities as they consider whether and how to take on new debt. Um, you know, for, for those who aren't as um, versed in the finance world, interest rates are partially set by the government's central banks, um, which incorporates their ability and their risk of borrowing. And this does vary across countries in Africa. Um, they also vary according to the type and the risk associated with the loan. So, Larger ticket loans from proven business models may tend to be cheaper than smaller size ones um, from risky or less proven um, areas or institutions. Um, it's one of the reasons that water.org works both with utilities and financial institutions to bridge that gap in understanding the market so that financing can be appropriately priced. Um, there, I think there are, as Joel said, and uh, as Gregoire noted, um, cases where uh, debt financing um, is appropriate. There are also cases where it may not work for some utilities. Um, but even in those cases, I think that there can be alternatives. So for example, um, in Kenya and a few other countries, some utilities have been able to access affordable financing due uh, to guarantee schemes or outputs, output based aid subsidies that improve the terms and conditions um, for utilities to borrow, um, helping to reduce and, and mitigate those costs. Um, on the loan tenure side, uh, domestic financial institutions, um, as, as Jeremy alluded to, they're not situated to have long-term repayable liabilities on their balance sheets, 30, 40-year loans. Um, what, that's really where you know, government entities and development financial institutions um, and as Joel referenced, uh, you know, pension funds, for example, um, uh, have a greater opportunity to come in. Um, what I've also seen work are revolving schemes where there's loans um, that are extended by commercial banks for say five to seven year periods and the infrastructure is financed over time, uh, both from the full customer base 
and from the project revenues associated with, uh, with new customers. Um, in some cases, those um, require some guarantees uh, so that those repayment streams will continue uh, and or some co-financing from uh, an investor, be a public investor or a private investor that can come in and provide that, um, that stopgap funding um, in case commercial banks uh, retire their loans after a, a smaller um, period of time. So there are creative ways um, that, uh, that the water and sanitation sector can finance to address both loan costs and, and loan tenure. And uh, we need more of those uh, going forward. Fantastic, hey, Gregoire. Yeah, just just to comment on on some of the terms that Rich is using, you know, guarantees and and those sorts of things. I my experience uh, working with with a number of water utilities is that um, those instruments can be complex and it can be hard to understand for people whose primary training is not in the finance world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, you'll have a water utility general manager who'll be an who'll be an engineer. Uh, and who, who will have, like me, I mean, <laughs> I'm an engineer, a very cursory understanding and superficial understanding of, of what these terms actually mean and somewhat of a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, reluctant approach to delving into the, the finer details of how this works, particularly as, you know, as we all know, um, water utilities require a great deal of, of personal engagement and there's a lot of personal work that goes into a lot of time that gets spent. So there's little sort of brain space available to uh, water utility management teams to, to relax and sort of learn these new complex uh, uh, you know, systems that are required of them in order to, to, to do this. So, and on the other side, you have the financial community, which is set in its ways, you know, um, is sometimes talking right over the head of the people that are supposed to be their clients and proposing instruments that are difficult to access. And so I think that there needs to be a bit of, of motion going in both directions. Those people that actually want to finance the water utilities, I think need to recognize, and maybe some of them recognize, and I'm just being, you know, I'm just saying things that everybody already knows, but need to recognize that they're talking to people who perhaps don't have the level of financial sophistication that they have or that some of their other clients have. And so they need to make those instruments available to them, right? So that's that requires some level of introspection on the part of the financing uh, bodies and people, right? And on the other side, there's, I think, a need, a clear need for training for on, on finance. And the World Bank has put out this great uh, uh, um, a series on, on, on utility financing, which I highly recommend everybody watch it's really great and uh and you know and so there's we there is a chance i think that we're talking at each other a little bit across this financing gap and one of the things that we're trying to do at city tops is bring in sort of a turnkey solution that's easy again it's only for small projects up to this point when they hopefully will be for big projects but it, we're finding that that makes it a lot easier for for our our utility uh uh you know uh, clients to understand what we're talking about when we when put it in in terms that that I can understand as a non-financial person, then the person who's across the, the table, who's also not a financial person, they can also understand what it is. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there's there's a there's a, a, a there's a break there that we need to remove or an obstacle, I think, that we need to remove. Acknowledge first and then remove. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, just to comment briefly, Gregoire, I mean, uh, I completely agree with that, and our our experience at Water.org bears that out as well. You know, we've 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 spent the better part of 15 years working with financial institutions to help them better understand um, and um, create opportunities and appropriately uh, understand risk in the water and sanitation arena. And likewise with the utility space. Um, part of what we've been doing with utilities is to help them understand at a basic level uh, the financial landscape and how to add better access different forms of finance and, and what's appropriate. So um, you've, you've helped cast uh, and, and frame part of the reason why we believe water.org is, is here among other institutions to help bridge that gap. So appreciate that. Yeah, I'll 
add in, you know, there is a substantial interest in providing that kind of technical assistance across many of uh, the multilateral uh, organization, lending institutions, bilateral uh, aid organizations. The USAID funded water sanitation hygiene finance program uh, has been doing that over the past five years. And uh, to plug uh, Rock Blue itself, it's, it's definitely one of our key interventions in guiding our partner utilities is helping bridge that understanding and think about, uh, about accessing finance. So uh, we'll carry on with that conversation, but I do wanna to get to the next question, uh, which is targeted at Gregor. Uh, a multi-part question again, following up on this previous question, can, can technology provide a solution? Uh, part of the reason that rates are high is because utilities are, are not credit worthy. Um, and and I, you talked about your ring fencing, you know, you talk to the potential for that to address it. Um, how can utilities improve their credit worthiness and therefore lower its barriers to lower its interest costs? Um, and can you talk to that specifically lessons learned from the Kenya WASREP program? All right. So let me start with the Kenyan WASREP program, uh, which does a credit worthiness assessment of the, uh, of the 86 uh, water utilities in Kenya. And so they get a hundred points, right? And um, only very few of them have to do with non-revenue water, I think about 15 of them. And about 65 of them have got to do with collection efficiency, age of debt, and those sorts of, of, uh, of uh, financial, um, uh, financial uh, KPIs. And yet, at this stage, we see a lot of utilities heavily focused on non-revenue water as the primary uh, KPI that they're chasing. So, Understanding how you're going to be rated as a utility. So, that, that, I mean, in the case of WASREB, it's published on their website. Uh, in the case of other countries, it might be more difficult to figure out how you're going to be rated. But understanding how someone who would be likely to give you money, to lend you money, is going to rate you is essential in order to be able to play the game correctly and appear beautiful in the beauty contest that is a loan application process, right? Because it's essentially a beauty contest. Give me money, I'll be able to pay it back to you, right? You have to convince them that, that that's, that's a winning proposition. So what we're seeing in Kenya is we're seeing, and I speak with a great deal of humility because I'm not every day in the trenches dealing with the problems that have to do, that utility managers have to deal with, right? So it's very easy for me to sit here in Paris and, and pontificate and I certainly didn't want to tell anyone what to do. But what I'm seeing is an emphasis on certain KPIs that people feel comfortable they can manage, like non-revenue water, and less emphasis on dealing with collection rates, reducing the age of debt, reducing the account receivables, including improving the, 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 the collection rate. Right? So for example, there have been, there's been a, a, people have been talking about smart meters because smart meters are a way to reduce non-revenue water as, soon as, as long as the data is properly used. But there's been little emphasis on how we're going to collect the money more efficiently. So this is clearly a plug for city taps. But our solution helps utilities collect money more efficiently. And so in that way, they can help, it can help improve the non-revenue um, the, I'm sorry, the not, the not non-revenue water aspects of the credit worthiness score, which in fact, as I said, are significantly more, right? They're worth more in the overall grade. So the other way in which the technology can use is, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, is the digital ring fencing of the revenue generated by the object itself. If the financial institution has a way to disable the unit, whatever it is, a pump, a motorcycle, a water meter, whatever, right? At a distance, if you don't pay for its use, then, and, and, it's, and it's deemed essential that you will use that thing, well, then there's a certain level of safety associated with making the loan for that thing, right? And so that's precisely what we're, what we're, uh, what we're doing as a first thing. But then in the second 
you know, once you've paid for the, the, the city suite solution itself, the city tap solution itself, those cash flows continue. And that's a really big difference with the solar pay as you go industry, by the way. Those cash flows continue as long as the solution works, the person is paying for water because they need water every day. Now you can take that cash flow, which has been characterized is digital, and you can borrow against it again. The same way that in some countries you're allowed to extract additional equity out of your house if the price of your house raises, rises. So you have this cash flow on this, I don't know, 2,000 customers of your utility who are generating $10 per day, $10 per month of revenue, $20,000 a month. Now you can go to the bank and say, I've got this $20,000 a month that's coming in. Lend me some money against that. And, in that, and again, it doesn't matter whether you're credit worthy or not, whether your entire balance sheet is clean, whether you've done everything right. As long as you can prove with data that that money's coming, then I believe that you will find banks, and we have found banks, who are interested in making loans against that. I believe you will find private investors who are interested in making loans against that. It's still baby steps, it's still early days, but the technology as a way of managing credit risk is a new way of doing business. And I hope it will be catalytic in reaching SDG 6. Thank you. I'm muted. I've just had somebody say that uh, banks will lend to somebody regardless of their credit worthiness. Uh, I, I, we have lenders on this call. Uh, Rich, I see you raising a hand. Uh, so, yeah, a couple quick points. And, and Gregoire, I would love to hear your, your thoughts about this. Um, so I, I, I agree that uh, there are opportunities to, um, to look at lending and financing um, for viable project-based opportunities like the ones that you're describing. Um, and I think that we can uh, look at more of that. It, it does seem though that um, the investor, the investors need to have the confidence that these agreements are with utilities. So the, the investors need to have the confidence that the utilities will actually utilize that repayment stream um, in the context of repayment, rather than, for example, using it to, um, to address uh, other financial issues that the utility is facing, or if it's a public utility uh, that's owned by a subnational government, that the subnational government won't come in and uh, effectively raid the revenues um, generated from those activities, right? So going back to Joel's earlier point, um, it is important to have proper governance and institutional relationships that ensure that the project finance um, revenue streams and the technologies work effectively. So, so in fact, the technology helps with that as well. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, because all the payments are digital, right? I mean, we all know this, right? Money leaks and water evaporates, right? right? So we want to make sure that there's no money evaporation happening. So you, you um, what happens is that the, the payments being made by the subscribers themselves are routed directly into essentially an escrow account that is owned in conjunction, in, in Kenya, you can actually, the, the financier can actually collect the money on behalf of the utility. Okay. And then redistribute the money back to the utility and pay itself. In other jurisdiction, that may not be possible, but in the case of a bank, for example, there could be a contract on the, on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the account that makes sure that the the that the um, the lender is is in fact getting paid uh, first before the utility gets paid. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you're saying is absolutely a problem. If the if the money goes back into the utility's general fund, there is absolutely no certainty that the utility is going to pay back. Uh, there's no more certainty than the utility is going to pay back than if you were lending just in general. And I should have made that clear earlier. I'm very sorry. The, the, the route of the, that the money takes is essential, is essential to the equilibrium of this, pro, of, this, of, this um, of this kind of project and this kind of financing. So the, the money goes from the subscriber to a dedicated collections account and then back to the utility and to the financier. Mm -hmm. okay. right? so, that the, so that this problem that you're talking about 
goes away. I mean, there is always the possibility that someone will raid the account. I mean, let's, you know, but it's significantly reduced, let's say. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. I appreciate it. Well, or Jeremy, anything to add on that? Or should we carry on? Thanks. Um, Joel, this one does go to you. I, I'm a utility in Southern Africa, um, and my advisors keep telling me to get the private sector involved. Everybody's raw, raw for this. A couple of big firms have approached us to say that we should set up a partnership and they'll pay for everything. Um, and uh, the IFC even came in and did a workshop for us to tell us how uh, triple P's work. How does this really give me better access to commercial repayable finance or is this a path that I might wanna go down? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. Um, and let me take a minute and just touch on a couple things. Um, the path is what we talked about earlier. It's to viability, operational and financial efficiency, and clarity in policy and institution on regulatory setting. That's the path, all right? Second point was raised, you know, it's very easy for us to all get into the weeds on these financing points. Um, and this can be very complicated. And if there are people online who are feeling a little lost, um, I feel your pain. Um, this is not about me, but I guess I'll reveal, I've never had a finance course in my life, okay? I don't have an MBA. I've never taken any public finance or project financing work, okay? What I have done is asked a lot of stupid questions. And there's a lot of people online who are a lot smarter than I am. So if you're feeling a little lost or intimidated, I get it. And the point that I wanna make is there are places you can go for more information. Second point I wanna make, and this is gonna take a minute, I wanna unpack this because the question was raised about PPPs, but that's not the only form of private finance. We've actually talked about several here. And I wanna unpack what this means. What's commercial finance, what's private finance? Um, and I'm gonna put it in a couple different blocks to make people uh, hopefully give some clarity on, on what we're talking about. So the highest and in some ways the most sophisticated form of, of commercial financing in the water sector is through bonds. You'll hear people talk about revenue bonds, green bonds, blue bonds, general obligation bonds, social impact bonds, SDG bonds. Don't worry about that, okay? Let's talk about what bonds really do, okay? They're difficult in emerging markets because there's not a lot of long-term money. The point here is, as Jeremy said, you're trying to match the life of the asset, which we know can be anywhere between 30 and 100 years if it's maintained. We're trying to match that financing with, um, with the life of the asset. It's very common in uh, private financing in mature markets. It's very competitively offered and you can do things like private placements. It's usually for bulk infrastructure. Um, and very often, unfortunately, it's in hard currencies. And I'm gonna talk about foreign exchange later, but in growing markets where the capital markets are taking off, it, we are seeing more and more of it. And it could be appropriate in, in, in even short-term periods of, of seven years or longer. There are credit enhancements and other things that can enhance it. They tend to have lower interest rates and they can be fixed or variable. Variable rates are more common in emerging markets. And sometimes you can get a guarantee or even a tax holiday um, along this line. So first we have bonds. Second, we have loans. These are usually from commercial banks, domestic commercial banks. The length of them tends to run three to seven years. They tend to have higher interest rates than bonds. And they're usually used for medium term investments related to O&M who are like pay packs. They can often be in local currency um, and most typically private finance, it's the most typical kind of private financing that we see in emerging markets. These interest rates tend to be a bit higher than bonds. Then we have things like vendor or supplier finance. This is suppliers providing finance on their assets. They can be meters, pumps, solar panels, vehicles, computers, or other kinds of equipment. This tends to be shorter term finance. Um, it can be in hard currency or local currency. 
Uh, and it can be self-financed or through a third party. We often see with meters where a utility will offer financing to a household, but it's provided through a third party. And Rich is, has been involved in this in the past. Um, the risk enhancement is often on the asset itself. So the meter or uh, the vehicle could be repossessed if there's not a payment. Um, it's certainly less popular than bonds and loans. Um, but in emerging markets, we've seen some movement in this and it is viable to, uh, depending on where you're working and the viability. Again, the interest rates here tend to be higher than loans or bonds. Next big bucket of money is microfinance. And this is really getting much popular and water.org has really done a lot of work on this. Uh, it evolved from business loans and we talked about some of the solar panels uh, we've been very involved in that and also moved it over into the water sector. We can talk about that later. It tends to be short term, higher interest rates. The borrow in this case is not a utility uh, or a service provider, it tends to be a household. Uh, it's almost always in local currency, it tends to be tied to an asset, toilet or meter, uh, some kind of connection. And the household, not the utility, is responsible for repayment. And really the best example here is in Bangladesh, and we can talk about more of that. That's particularly in sanitation. Uh, this was water.org's original business model, and it tends to be, while it's expensive, uh, it tends to be effective. And I wanna point out, it's not expensive if you compare what's going on with hard currency-based loans versus domestic loans, and the depreciation of local currency versus hard currencies. So let me be very clear on this. A loan that you take in dollars at three or 4% can end up costing you a lot more money than if you take a loan at 15 or 16% in local currency, especially if it's a longer term loan. Last bucket of money there is here is, is PPPs. And these became very popular in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, the UK was really at the forefront of this. And I'm going to grossly oversimplify this, but it effectively was paying for infrastructure and operations by the private sector. Uh, there were some successes in places like Manila, but there were also a lot of public failures, places like Jakarta, Dar, and Buenos Aires. Um, and the model has clearly evolved. Um, it's no longer technically financing the water. In fact, the bank often funds a PPP if the government decides that's the way they wanna go. Um, now it's typically, there's all kinds of acronyms out there, but the private sector will be identified to come in to design a facility, build it, and then operate it for some period of time. There are lots of hybrids on this. There's long-term opportunities here. And it's particularly appropriate where the skills may not be available. There's a need for a lot of political will here. Historically, there have been labor concerns and it's really been more popular in the Middle East, in Asia and Latin America, and some parts of West Africa than East and Southern Africa. Um, a lighter version of this is management contracts. All of, all of these models, there are versions of it, there are buzzwords you're gonna hear, but that's the different pots of money. And as an operator, as a water service provider, one of the things you need to do when you become efficient and become credit worthy is look at the full breadth of options that are here. And there are pros and cons to each one. And there are organizations out there that can assist in reviewing this. Um, so with that, I've taken more time, Chris, but I just, I thought it was important for to understand what we're talking about when we're relaying private financing. And I hope that was useful. Chris, can I just jump in? Um, and Please, this is something that Joel and I could probably riff off on for hours and hours, but I got a, a call earlier today from a water utility who said uh, that they've been looking and I know that there's some people on the call who are dialed in who've been involved with this on the Kenya Pool Water Fund. And somebody had asked me, uh, we're, I'm not in Kenya, but I'm somewhere else in Africa, and there, there's talk of doing a pool and water fund. Where does that fit? And I love, Joel, how you demystified this, because the, a pooled water fund is not anything which is 
outside of these instruments we've already discussed. Right. From a utilities perspective, and, and that's where I think it's really interesting, the utilities seem to feel like, oh, this is a different instrument, but it's it's not different than what they're already, what, what the options look like. It just means that their capitalization from the for the fund is coming from the capital markets from a bond issuance, let's say, or wherever else, but it's right. a loan from the that uh, water fund, from that pooled fund to the utility. And I right. feel like, like you said, buzzwords end up making it something where people don't quite understand what we're talking about. Right. And the right. last thing we need to do is have a utility feel like they're, they're either taking on something new and scary or that they don't understand what they're actually getting in on. And so right. I, I would, I'm just curious to know whether that's something that you're also seeing that people it's almost like the, the death by jargon, which right. makes it so that utilities don't understand what they're actually being offered. And I think that's the right. same thing for service providers too. That might right. be ones like Gregoire and City Taps. So just curious right. to know on your what you think. So two points, great questions. So first of all, if you don't understand and ask, that's the bottom line, okay? This is not rocket scientist. It, it, it can be intimidating, I get it, I've been there. Uh, Every question that's going to be put in this two-hour session or for the next five weeks, I've asked, okay? So no one should be embarrassed or intimidated about asking these questions. It's complex, right? Um, revolving funds. They exist all over the world. I'm well aware of the Kenya Pool Fund. We did work on it early on, collaborated with the Dutch and the Kenyan government on it. Um, I know there are issues around there. I don't want to get into the details there, but I do want to talk about revolving funds. So they've operated in numerous countries around the world, even in the US, uh, states run revolving funds. Uh, the US EPA is a funder of a revolving fund and uh, happens all over the world. Philippines is another good example. All you're doing with a revolving fund is there it is an intermediary that instead of looking at one utility, they may be looking at a pool of utilities. And instead of trying to raise money on one utility, they're trying to raise resources on the back of a number of utilities. They've worked in many instances, but they've also had problems in, issue, in, in instances. Because say the four of us are utilities and everybody else is paying, but I default, I can affect the ability of the rest of you to raise money. And that's the bottom line behind this. They're very valuable, they're very important in certain markets, but they're just another one of the tools that's out there to meet the agenda. And we need all the tools. That's the, that's the other point I wanna make. This spectrum of financing that we're talking about, we need all of them, you need to look at all of them. Some are more uh, appropriate in environments. In lower income countries, microfinance may be the best way to start and focus. As you mature and as you build up, you can look at some of the other options. Bonds tend to be in more sophisticated markets, but we've seen them in Kenya, we've seen them in South Africa, we've seen them explored elsewhere. And there are, we haven't talked about these, we've touched on it. There are a number of credit enhancements and financial tools to help mitigate the risk with all of these financial uh, instruments. So don't be intimidated. Uh, it's, it's tough, it's not always very clear, but um, there is a lot of experience and there is a lot of help out there. And, and uh, thanks for the plug earlier for the course. There is a five module course that we put together trying to look at um, commercial finance in the water sector. We're working on a second course actually specifically on credit worthiness. And again, I think the point I wanna leave you with on this thing, it's not so much about the money and it's not so much about these instruments, it's getting to the point where you can uh, become credit worthy and start tapping into these resources. And we're behind the curve in Africa than in, than in other regions and we have to up our game. Great work has been done by a number of institutions include those here, but we have a long way to go. We have a lot more work to do, thanks. Thanks, Joel. I, I mean, I feel like we just uh, had a masterclass on uh, on the basic tenets of, uh, of utility finance and really appreciate breaking it down into very easy to understand language uh, for a complicated subject. Um, you talk about uh, you know this toolbox idea, and I'm going to confuse things further by introducing yet another one. 
Um, there's a lot, there's, everybody keeps talking about green finance or climate finance. But I only uh, and I've only but I've only seen these happen in the energy sector, uh, you know, paying for uh, renewable energy or something like that. Can we use it in the water uh, and sanitation market? How does it relate to how does water and sanitation relate to climate change or how can I create that linkage and how do I ask, how can I find green finance for my projects and who can help me? Uh, Jeremy. Thanks, Chris, for the question. Um... So there are a lot of different ways to answer this, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out exactly what the right one is. And, and looking at the audience and thinking about the fact that, again, many of you are either public or private utilities, I'll, I'll make this as concrete as possible because I think that we can easily get lost in the theoretical abstract world of this. So I'll, I'll use an example from Cambodia on some things that I worked on a few years back. We did an analysis to see as far as looking at the utilities, so these are private water operators, where their costs were. And it showed that over 50% on average of their cost was associated with the power used for abstraction uh, for different parts of the treatment process and everything else. And so the question was, well, if you're relying on power that's coming from the grid, and so you're paying for that electricity, and if that is something which hypothetically could be something that we can play with and, and make either lower or more responsible, what does that look like and how do we do that? So the first thing that we checked out was what is the, the opportunity for using renewable energy rather than use, relying on the grid for power? And we found that the utilities that we were talking about had a very high number of solar days per year, which meant that they could use solar and, and PV to power all of their energy needs rather than relying on the grid. So the question then turned into, well, this is really interesting and it seems like it could work, but how do we actually finance all of this? And so then that turned into a question of where is the finance going to come from? And again, back to the earlier question on and comments on useful life of the asset, we talked about the fact that this is not something that hypothetically we want to see financed in a three to five year period, but instead, how do we make this over, let's say a 20, 30 year period? And that's the plug that I'll make. I see that uh, a colleague of mine is on a uh, friend from the AFDB from the African Development Bank. I'm going to, to put a challenge out to the African Development Bank, to the IFC, to others, to see whether or not they want to make long-term loans available on an aggregate basis to utilities that want to start using renewable energy. And I think that that allows for that interconnection between green finance, climate finance, and then looking at the question of, of actual infrastructure investments for the utilities from a much more macro point of view. And there are a lot of really good things that have been written about this. There's, uh, I always point my students to read the publication that came from World Bank and WRI a couple of years ago on the question of how do we green gray infrastructure? And I feel like that sort of comment needs to be what we're thinking about when we're looking at how do we get to a world that's not going to be facing the climate change issues, that's not going to be facing all these other problems. I'm sitting outside of Cape Town and I, I see that uh, there are people from who are either with or formerly with city of Cape Town uh, who dealt with the drought crisis. That drought was in part due to climate change. How do we make sure that we're doing things that are intelligent to either adapt or mitigate the, what those things could look like? And part of that also means for those of you who are sitting in dry parts of Africa, if you're sitting in Northern Kenya and trying to figure out how are you going to be able to find that water table to abstract from, we need to find new ways to allow for that to happen. So my argument to, I guess, answer your question is that there are a lot of pots of money out there that might not be the pot that you as a utility are thinking about to give you access to that money. Don't always go back and knock on the same doors and say, we are a water utility, so we only want to get water money. Think about it as we are, we are providing an essential service and the service that we're providing will be negatively impacted and affected if we can't be responsive from a climate point of view. There are dozens of opportunities from a number of different entities, large and small, that offer both large and small ticket sizes for you as a utility to be able to access that money that you need. So I would, I'll leave it at that, that there are a wide variety of different places to go, but no matter what, it's also a part of how you package that request. 
So if, if you keep on going to water utilities, or if you go to water utility financiers and say, we want to do something that's out of the box, they might not feel comfortable with it. Start thinking about how you can more creatively do that. And I think that you'll be successful. Uh, I'll stop there. Thanks. I have a question for Jeremy. Everyone, yeah, I do, I do as well. Um, Greg, you, Greg, why do you want to go first? Yeah, I just want to ask you, Jeremy, you, you, you mentioned, you know, production of, of green energy to, for pumping and, you know, and 90% of utilities usually, energy is usually pumping. So um, what about the reduction of uh, non-revenue water? Do you see that as something that can be, because every cubic meter that's, you know, shipped through the network, consumes or contains a certain amount of energy, you know, at least virtual. Uh, so if you reduce the leakage, the physical leaks, at least, uh, you should be reducing the, the CO2 impact. So do you think there's a, there's opportunity there or, or no? So I would love to say absolutely. Yeah. The, like that's a great story and, and everybody should buy into it. The challenge is I, so I, I was at a climate conference where I was speaking and I talked a little bit about non-revenue water and I looked at the audience and it was, this was a little before COVID and I was surprised at just nobody, they didn't understand what I was talking about. It was like they totally glazed over. So it's, it's a, a problem. Again, this isn't a jargon thing. I, I didn't think that non-revenue water was something that people wouldn't get, but a lot of the climate people didn't seem to understand what I was talking about when I used that as an example. And I, see. I would say that's a challenge. There's also the challenge of, so if we look at, for example, carbon markets and carbon credits in a lot of countries, it's still relatively difficult to price carbon and to look at CO2 in more developed countries. So put that into a developing country context. And I think that, that we need more maturity from the financial sector so they can really appreciate that. Mm. Rich, do you yeah, have a question? I mean, yeah, maybe just to build on what Greg Warr was saying. Um, so my my impression, and it's really just a hypothesis at the moment, is that uh, the social investor community and um, governments and other entities that are really focused on climate tend to focus, by and large, more on mitigation, uh, whereas the water and sanitation sector and utilities tend to focus more on adaptation. Do you see a similar disconnect um, in those areas, um, or and if and if if not, is it really more a matter of you know getting the getting this issue that Greg Warr was talking about, um, making sure that we're that we're talking uh, effectively to one another and not at one another and packaging things effectively, or are there some more fundamental disconnects in those constructs that you think need to be addressed in some way? So. I don't want to speak for everybody, um, but I do think that there is a tremendous disconnect that does need to be resolved. And I do think that there's not necessarily the money that's being made available by some of the players. What I will say, though, and this harkens back to what we were discussing earlier, and I might disagree a little bit with, I forget who had said it, about that there might not be sufficient money from institutional investors to participate and that it might be challenging to see capital markets transactions. I've been doing a lot of work with the institutional investors across Africa, but really focusing more on South Africa because of the maturity of the financial sector here. And what I continue to always see is that there is an increasing appetite for climate, whether that be a legitimate one or whether it's just shareholders and, and others who say, we want to, to see that we are investing in green. When I don't parse between different things, and when I say, Here's an opportunity to invest, let's say, in a city that's doing a wide variety of things, some of them having to do with water adaptation uh, or looking at infrastructure from a fresh way and trying to make that something which is more green, quote unquote. There's, there's a lot of appetite and they don't even want to look more deeply at it. And so I feel like there's potentially an opportunity for the water sector to be able to participate and access that green money if they don't get too deep in the details and instead rely on the fundamentals of creditworthiness of the, the utility or the borrower, as well as the overall picture of the ability to be able to service that debt. Uh, Joel, I see you came off of mute, so I'm not sure if you want to add anything. Yeah, I just want to reinforce a couple of things Jeremy said. I, I think the 
discussion around the water climate change nexus is still evolving. We're behind where the energy sector has been historically, but I think we're rapidly catching up. You know, water was a part of the um, last COP meeting in Madrid. It's front and center in the upcoming policy meetings around the COP um, in, that'll take place later this year in Scotland. There was just an adaptation commission meeting around this um, where water featured very prominently. And we just released a report this last week called EPIC EPIC, which is really looking at the impact of droughts and floods on the whole water climate discussion. Having said all of this, we can go, we can have another whole discussion on climate and water. The foundational things that Jeremy mentioned and I mentioned earlier still hold true. To tap into this financing, you need to get more efficient and you need to have your institutional arrangements clear and transparent. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. Uh, Ed, you've done a great job of segueing into my next question, actually targeted at Rich. Um, you know, we're convinced uh, using debt uh, or, or commercial lending is a great way to finance my projects. It's a good idea. There's lots of different mechanisms out there that I can access. But what do I need to do to do this? Um, you, you, Joel, you've talked, uh, you've given us a framework of the, the key underlying uh, fundamentals, but what are the, the concrete steps that I need to do in the short, medium, and long term? If I'm a, a generic uh, utility um, somewhere in the developing world, and uh, I'll be looking at Rich, uh, the question's targeted at you, but I certainly uh, think this is one that we can open up. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm going to maybe repeat or repackage some of the things that have already been said. So, uh, you know, number one, um, understand and as needed, improve your overall financial position. This, this would include repaying or staying on track with any outstanding debts. Um, investors invest in financially solvent institutions and projects emerging from those institutions. Um, I think secondly, as Joel mentioned at the top, address and shore up your governance and management structure. Um, investors, they want to invest in institutions where they can have confidence in the management team and a leadership that will commit to securing and deploying and implementing new financing. Um, I think Jeremy mentioned this earlier, uh, create a three to five year business plan um, and even better, uh, a long-term capital facilities plan if you can do it um, that outlines where you want to invest what sources of financing you're seeking and, and how you're going to grow them over time. Um, I, I, want to be, I, I want to be clear about, you know, to, to, your, to the framing of your question, Chris, um, I, I think it's important to recognize that short and longer term debt should be or can be a part of your financing strategy, but you have to figure out what the World Bank and others call the three T's, your taxes, your transfers, your tariffs, that really do form the basis of long-term repayment. Um, those are fundamental. Um, and your business and capital facilities plan should reflect those. Um, I and then from there, um, identify and evaluate a set of bankable opportunities. Um, as Gregoire mentioned, uh, as an example, look, look for uh, those that once invested can, can offer real value, can generate cash flows, um, and maybe some others that will require drawing from your larger revenue base and, and from different capital sources. Um, investors are looking for confidence in the technical quality of the improvements, but even more, they want to understand how your proposals fit in with their assessment frameworks. Um, and then form, form the relationships with financial institutions or investors uh, that will allow you to pitch those opportunities. Um, start small and, and then seek to build that track record over time. Um, and then as, as, as you're moving along and thinking about financing, um, begin to explore, if you already haven't, um, those potential opportunities for co-investment or guaranteeing um, portions of investment so you help mitigate uh, some of the risks of bringing in um, private financing. So at a high level, those would be some of the key steps that I would um, outline. And, and yes, I would definitely love um, others to chime in here as well. Rich, do you want to just expand a little bit on that last one, the co-investing? Uh, give a definition for somebody who might not understand that concept. Well, so, so co-investing could mean investing from different sources of private and commercial financing. Um, it, but as Joel mentioned, it, it can also involve public-private uh, financing uh, partnerships as well. 
Um, so what what um, what what's often uh, referred to these days as blended finance. Um, so look at those opportunities, um, both in terms of providing you know debt and or equity, uh, and uh, mitigating the risk through uh, measures such as guarantees. Thanks, Rich. Gregor, I saw a hand come up. You're muted. Sorry. Um, you mentioned, Rich, start small and do small projects. And one of the issues that, that we've come up with at City Taps, because we, we tend to do small projects, you know, which is like $100,000 $1, to maybe $2 million, that's a small project, uh, mm -hmm. in my, at least in my book. Um, there isn't anyone who wants to fund that. Mm -hmm. um you know there are i mean with some very few um exceptions like the gsma mobile for development fund mm -hmm. uh you know um nobody is capable has the, meaning has the capacity to disperse the um, money in that kind of, of that size tickets uh particularly for risky technology that's unproven right mm -hmm. so it's, it, we keep running into this problem where uh, utilities don't necessarily have the CapEx money to invest in our solution. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the DFIs say, oh, well, you know, we can, we can write you a check for $5 million. And you're like, well, that's not really serious because a company like CityTaps can't really take $5 million all at once. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not used car salesmen. We're not thieves, so we're not going to take that kind of money when we don't think that we can actually spend it responsibly. So there is this, this sort of disconnect between the financiers who want large projects that are nicely wrapped with a bow on top. You know, they, are, they, they want what one of my friends calls left-handed blue-eyed Canadians, which is to say exactly what they want and not anything else, right? And then the vast majority of projects out there, which are run by right-handed blue-eyed Canadians or, you know, no-handed Kenyans, you know, and or ambidextrous Kenyans. And so the, 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 and so the, this, this, this sort of need to fit into a tiny box and to have just the right size, but just the right kind of investor um, from the point of view of the people looking for money. And I say this as the CEO of a, of a, of a, of a startup, and as someone who helps water utilities find money to finance the projects that we offer to them, it's frankly exhausting. And at the same time, I can't fault the people who have the money, who have bosses. And here I speak to you if, if you've ever asked for money from a financier and, and felt frustrated that they weren't listening to you because they have a boss and they have investors and those people have set rules that they have to follow. And so we, the people, people who ask have to be empathetic to their needs, whether or not we get frustrated by those needs, mm -hmm. um, so that we can somehow accommodate them as much as possible. And yet at the same time, I feel that, you know, so part of the way needs to be, needs to be uh, traveled by the investors towards what the reality of the market is. You know, a utility with 30,000 subscribers generating $10 per subscriber per month isn't going to borrow $50 million. It doesn't make any sense. And yet you have a lot of these utilities out there. So there is a, you know, there's a, there is a, there's this, this gap in financing that has to be addressed so that especially the, the innovative projects can be financed. The ones that haven't been tried, the ones that might fail, Right, and for which there is a risk, a huge risk that the utility is taking, right? Or you risk that the person will lose their job if the utility, if the project fails. And, and the need of the financiers to do what they're supposed to do so that they won't lose their jobs, right? So this, this I, I, and, and you know, it's, I, I don't have a good solution except what we're trying to do for ourselves, which is to say, find investors, the very few investors who are willing to go in on that ticket at $100,000 to $500,000, who are willing to take the risk that the, that the technology will work and that the, this, this triangular uh, repayment scheme that we're proposing will actually work. And we expect that once that's done and once it's been shown to work, 
that will open the floodgates, if you'll allow a bad water joke. It will prime the pump into a larger amount of financing into the sector. But it's, it's a gamble, and not everybody has the privilege and, and, and the runway, the financial runway, or the institutional safety, right? The job safety to take those risks. Mm -hmm. and so beyond the financing thanks, aspect, thanks, there's other things. Thanks. Sorry. I'm going to cut you off there and allow uh, our other panelists an opportunity to, to address that. Or uh... I'm happy to jump in, Chris, just very briefly on, on Rich's points. Um, I think you did a very good job of articulating the various things you need to get to creditworthiness and, and start talking to markets. Just a couple other things, tools that are out there. Um, and it really involves around this benchmarking concept or the indicators or the key performance indicators that you would look at to start improving your efficiency. And we're blessed in the water sector that there are 30 or 50 that you can use that are generally accepted. In fact, there's a website called IBNet. You know, it's getting a little old, um, but it has over 5,000 utilities and they can post their, uh, their key performance indicators and you can see how you're doing. Um, it's run by the bank, but it's a self-reporting system. And it's actually going, to, going through, we're making a major investment in upgrading that and expanding it. But for the point of looking at the key performance indicators that Rich was articulating, it's a very good site. Likewise, um, WASREB in Kenya, the regulator there, does a very good job. And they go further. They actually have an index. Uh, that they created with some bank support, really looking at who's the most credit worthy utility, um, which is very valuable and is a model and tool that could be used elsewhere. Finally, we haven't talked much about credit rating institutions. And I know they have a mixed reputation in some places. They're often tied to the 2009 financial crisis, but I, and I, I don't work for one, no one pays me from them, but I do wanna point out that there are some assets there can do something called a private rating where they will come in and actually look at your operations and give you what's sometimes referred to as a shadow rating. You can't use it to go to the market. Uh, in Africa, there's a couple groups that do it and it's relative, it has a relatively modest cost. And if you think you're getting there, um, then it's a good tool to use to double check to see whether you are in fact credit worthy. The course we're putting together also has an online tool that will be available if you upload your audited financial statement and make some subjective inputs. It can give you a roadmap to getting to credit worthiness. It's not there yet, but that's what we're working on. So Rich Ray laid out some very good points, and I just wanted to add a few other tools that I think might be appropriate for those who are looking uh, to get more efficient and ultimately more credit worthy. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. The uh, and moving on, um, question for uh, for Jeremy. Uh, my utility has recently gone to commercial lenders and uh, and others uh, looking for financing, and uh, but they've come back and said that we don't have bankable projects. But I have a whole list of projects in our strategic plan that need uh, to be paid for. And I need, uh, you know, I don't have the, the, the cash on hand to pay for these capital projects. We've done lots of studies on these projects, hired lots of consultants, and we've got uh, concept studies, pre-feasibility studies that says that these are the right project to do. We've got rough cost estimates, um, but full feasibility studies need even more consultants and lots of money to pay for them that we just don't have in our budget. Is there some way that I can access funding to pay for these? Is, uh, is there help out there that we can bridge that gap between, uh, between our needs and, uh, and achieving a, a funding mix for these, uh, just showing the bankability of these projects? Thanks, Chris. And I guess I'll start and, and I should say thank you again to Rock Lou for hosting this. And I know that Peter and Chris, I think you're involved in this as well, have been working hard to create something which is designed exactly to help utilities with what you're describing, to help utilities to walk from the early stage of here's 
a concept that we have. And, and the way I, I like to think about it, there's a, there's a maturity process, there's a development process. So it's concept. Concept turns into that ideation, which turns into a pre-feasibility, which then turns into the full feasibility, which then turns into that approach to financial institutions, which allows you to get to financial close. And when I say financial institutions, it doesn't need to necessarily be commercial finance. We can talk about repayable finance being uh, DFI money or anybody else that's doing that. But the, the question often is, and again, knowing all the utilities that are out there, you're, you'll say, so how do I do that? How do I make sure that I'm approaching this and that I'm doing it in a way that I'm not then beholden to one entity? And I feel like that often becomes the challenge for many of you as utilities. You say, well, I've gotten support from, Chris, I'll pick on USAID since you're part of Washington. Um, I've got support from USAID. That means that I need to now take money from the DFC because uh, there's an expectation. And, and I think that we need to get away from that sort of thinking that if you get support from an entity, whether it be a charitable foundation or an aid agency, which is linked to somebody else, that that means it leads to certain money coming in, which I know many organizations don't necessarily take that approach, but some do. And so I would, I would argue that that's part of the question, but not necessarily the exact question you've asked. So your question is, how do, how do we move from where we are to the next level as a utility with limited funds or as a project sponsor with limited funds? My argument would be that when we think about this, what I would really want people to think about is where do we want to get to as far as the overall outcomes, the overall picture, everything else that we want to see addressed. And there are charitable foundations and aid agencies out there who love to play the role of being that, that I don't know, funding source, whatever we want to call it, that helps to overcome that particular obstacle. So we have an obstacle where there's money that's, there's a million dollars that's required. That million dollars unlocks the 30 million. That's what you're looking for. So again, I would argue that this is a packaging question, much the same way I've said packaging question on the green finance and how do we access climate finance money? It's the same thing. I feel like what are utilities might not be able to figure out who they should be approaching because they keep on approaching the same people when as a matter of fact, there might be others out there who'll be motivated by different things. I know that there are some people who, who question whether there's a direct causal link between quality of water and health outcomes, but there are health entities out there that have a large amount of money that water utilities are not necessarily hitting up. And I would argue that we need to think more creatively about what that overall ecosystem is to not keep on asking from those limited pots of money for, we wanna do this additional study, we wanna do these other things, Let's try to find new ways to approach. And again, to come back to the beginning, I, I know that Rock Blue is in a position that it's trying to do exactly that as far as support to utilities. So I would encourage anybody who likes the sound of what I've just said to get in touch with Peter, Chris, others, and ask them exactly, how do we go about being more intelligent about what we're doing? Because if we keep on getting the same results of, would no, there's no money left for you, going and asking somebody a third time isn't gonna be different than what they said the second or first time you've asked. Uh, Chris, I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. The, um... there is a, there's a specific pot of money that's designated yep. for studies uh, at the French um, um, finance ministry. It's called the FASEP fund. And the nice thing about the FASEP fund is that if a French entity asks for this money, having an MOU in hand with, uh, with a, a foreign business, that could be a water utility, then the FASEP will fund the study. So if you're a water utility and you want to, um, you want to ask a, a French uh, consulting firm uh, to do the study for you, uh, you could approach them and offer them to, to uh, submit a FASEP request for that. FASEP is spelled F-A-S-E-P. Uh, you can look it up online and uh, uh, there's, it's reserved for French companies. So, you know, you won't be able to call on an American one, but uh, there's no obligation that you'll buy French after that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it might be an avenue uh, for, for you to, to fund some of these projects and, and turn them into bankable projects uh, later on. 
Thanks, Gregor. And uh, you know, there are there are several project prep uh, funds out there um, that can be accessed, and uh, you know, we can follow up. Uh, we're providing some more information on where you can find some of those resources as well. The um, you know, it, aware that time is getting short here, and uh, that we do want to open up to uh, audience questions. Um, but I, this is an important question. You know, if so much of uh, my mandate is getting uh, better water services to to the poor, uh, whether they're in rural areas or peri-urban areas. Um, but but obviously or apparently they cannot afford to pay even cost recovery tariffs, um, let alone paying enough uh, to cover debt servicing. Where, where do I find this revenue to pay back uh, uh, debt if I want to go the commercial lending route? Or, or any kind of uh, uh, debt, uh, debt approach. And uh, uh, Rich, I'm reaching out to you again on this question, but we'll ask others. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, well, I, I would begin by first challenging the notion that there is a single segment of the population known as the poor. I, I try not to use that terminology, but I know um, people do sometimes. Um, we've been working with various um, enterprises, financial institutions, utilities, uh, community-based organizations that um, for over 30 years. And what I can tell you is that, that what, what's for often referred to as the poor are not equally poor. Um, many people living in poverty can and want to finance improvements. So Joel referenced um, the work that water.org has done with microfinance institutions in terms of household finance. So about 90% um, of water credit customers earn less than the World Bank's income standard for global poverty. And of that segment, um, even those that would be classified as living in extreme poverty have participated and benefited in those financing schemes. So why is this happening? Well, often it happens because these families often pay for poor quality water in various ways, um, direct expenses on water, time, labor costs, health, um, that can actually be 10, 15, 20x per liter more expensive than connecting to water networks. Um, they're already paying a lot in coping costs. And too often, uh, tariff schemes can actually subsidize non-poor customers by setting rates artificially low, below cost and lower than the um, non-poor's willingness and ability to pay. So I would start by saying examining the tariff structure um, across all customer segments not just domestic, but also commercial, industrial, and agricultural uses can reveal some opportunities to charge appropriate prices and set, um, for, example, for example, minimum lifeline tariffs for those who do live in the most extreme poverty. Um, and I think that in some cases they can generate where there's management, where there's political will, uh, revenue that can cover debt servicing over time. I'd like to add that we developed our technology specifically to address the bottom of the pyramid. And I agree with Rich that that's a very imprecise and uh, not particularly attractive uh, uh, term, but it's, it's widely understood, so I'll use it. Um, we find that uh, in Niger, uh, where people are very poor, um, even in, in the capital city where we have over 50% of, our, of, our, of the people benefiting from our solution, making less than $5 per day, um, the, or even $3 per day, actually, um, people are able to afford water at home in a dignified manner. Uh, they're able, they become essentially the utility's best customers because they pay in advance, 15 days in advance. They have no accounts receivable, right? They never, they're never in debt to the utility. If they ever get cut off because they've run out of credit, they can top up their account and they have water within 30 minutes, which is significantly more convenient for them than having to wait 96 hours or 48 hours for some guy to show up and re reset it. And as Rich said, they pay the regulated tariff, which is you know, uh, 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 15, 20, and in some place, places in Kenya, 100 times below what the resellers will sell, not to mention the time and health savings. Now, importantly, with the right technology, it's also possible to avoid this problem of subsidizing the rich through the poor, uh, through uh, 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 the basic step tariffs that is so uh, traditional, because with that tariff, 
the poor get the first six or 10 cubic meters at the subsidized price, which they might be able to pay significantly more. With the right digital technology, you can actually set tariffs on a quasi-individual basis, based, for example, on the, val on, the, on the tax value property of your property or on the size of your family or et cetera. And you could, you could set tariffs so that, you know, the widow with five children pays, you know, five cents per cubic meter all, all month or five cents per cubic meter, then 10, then 15. And the, the, you know, the lawyer with two children and the, and the swimming pool uh, starts his tariff, not at five cents, but at 50 cents or at a, at, a, at a dollar. And that's possible when you have the right kind of technology, but even without going that far, far into the future and that far out of what's useful, ensuring that the rich also pay is the best way to make sure that the poor gets to have service. And often water utilities struggle to collect from their largest customers. Mm -hmm. And deploying a solution that forces people to pay, the, the prepaid or pay-as-you-go solution, is one way to do that. And that's one route to water equity. Chris, can I jump in for one second on this? Just expanding on. Please, um, look, I, you know, I don't want to keep citing World Bank reports because the report is one thing; putting it into action is a, a very different thing, and I deeply appreciate that. But in the, there was a very um, often quoted study that we put out last year on subsidies, and the main high headline for it from it was that we're using the public money that we're getting very inefficiently and it's benefiting the rich and we need to look at better ways to structure those subsidies. There is another report, the, the second report along this line that'll be out in a couple of weeks, which is looking at tariffs. There hasn't been a major new study on tariffs in about 12 years. So there'll be one coming out in, in a couple of weeks and I'm happy to share that through uh, Rock Blue. But, you know, there are new um, and improved ways of using the public money and putting tariffs in place uh, to achieve the objectives that we've been talking about today, to get better services to the poor, because that's where the gap is and that's where the focus has to be. There's a lot of misnomers out there, including about the public resources. You know, public money is going in, it must be serving the poor. And we know that's not true. So there are some very fundamental and foundational things that can be done to start addressing this. It's not an easy solution, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying reading a report is a solution to all this, but um, there are some things that can be done that are fairly foundational in moving this along and getting us to the ultimate agenda of universal access. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. Uh, and, and that was an amazing discussion. Um, I want to focus in. Um, last week or a couple a couple of weeks ago, we had the uh, fecal sludge management uh, uh, conference. Um, you know, and today we keep talking a lot about financing uh, water sector and where water utilities and the like. What about sanitation? Um, all our wastewater treatment works uh, are in need of upgrading. Um, we, we need to find new technology for uh, treating FSM from our on-site sanitation customers. Um, but in the absence of sanitation tariffs, um, you know, how, how do I link this? How do I ring fence this, as Gregor has talked about? How, what other mechanisms do I have to, uh, to access financing for sanitation projects? Uh, and sorry, I was directing that at, at Joel, but if, uh, but if anybody wants to jump in on that, uh, please do. Sure, I can start off the conversation. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, double the number of people are uh, without safely managed sanitation that are getting water, uh, that aren't getting water. It's a huge issue and it's been highlighted in a big way. Um, some groups in particular, the Gates Foundation, really pushed on this. And I think they've moved the, not only the donor community, but the service providers along this line. So let me state some, some just basic facts. Uh, yes, most mature service providers do in fact provide sanitation services and donor funds and private sector funds are in fact used to finance sanitation. 
second point I want to make is there's no special sauce or secret way to finance sanitation. A lot of the foundational issues we talked about today are as uh, relevant to sanitation as they are to water. Nevertheless, there are some additional things we need to look at, and I want to touch on a few of them. Um, one goal is to have the service providers deliver adequate services um, in a technology blind way in charging for water and sanitation in one bill. Um, there are good examples where water and sanitation are charged together. And this is a robust way of getting the services up and running in South Africa is a good example where we see this. The tariff itself is equally important. And the question is really are O&M and capital costs for sanitation in the tariff structure? We see this in Brazil where the costs are included and this has uh, resulted in a major rollout of sanitation services. There's a number of other countries where this works but often it's not even in the tariff. So you want a starting place. That's why there's no money because we're not charging for the services and we have to put some basic services in place. Um, and additional funding is needed through both public, and I talked about the subsidy. This is one place it really should go, um, as well as private sector resources. Um, we also need to look at financing for sanitation across the sanitation, the service chain. Um, for on-site sanitation and fecal sludge management, capital costs and OM costs borne by the household. And these are often informal. There are some exceptions in Malaysia, Manila, Bangladesh, and Durban. And poor households are in fact delivering in, and providing their own on-site systems. And the burden has fallen to them. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about some of the difference between rural and urban. You know, we, there, there is a movement to not subsidize rural sanitation, um, but that doesn't mean we necessarily, and this is going to be somewhat controversial, but it doesn't mean we need to import that into the urban setting. Often, the poor use on-site systems and the rich have subsidized systems through sewers, and we need the full range and the full breadth of sanitation options, even in urban areas. We saw this in Ghana where some development partners and some stakeholders were pushing back in one of our projects in terms of providing subsidies for poor households around sanitation. However, the outcome from that project showed that really targeted subsidies uh, when implemented well and for, could significantly improve sanitation services. Um, however, even when we can't subsidize those at the household level, uh, we can facilitate services. And again, I want to go back to microfinance and I want to touch on Kenya and Bangladesh, which are two really good examples where this is going on at the household level, a lot of microfinance opportunities. Um, the Bangladesh example, ironically, came out of the solar panel model and then moved into sanitation. And uh, it, it's proven quite effective. And I think there are opportunities. At the other end of the service chain on treatment, um, PPPs are used sometimes. For example, in Durban, um, there's a successful example where tertiary treatment and reuse of industrial water is being done through a PPP and leverage private financing for that based on the revenue it's generating has improved the service end of it, but also the capacity of the utility. Uh, my colleague Mira mentioned Tamil Naidu. That's another good example where results-based financing um, has, uh, has, has really had an impact on this. And it's, it's made a um, significant uh, impact in terms of how sanitation is being financed in the India context. The challenge on all this is scaling it up. How do we get to uh, a replicable system? It's the same challenge we have with water. Um, and a fundamental of this goes back to the foundational issues I, I mentioned. Many times sanitation services aren't in anyone's level of responsibility. Um, and when they are, it's often treated as secondary rather than primary. So the whole policy and institutional and regulatory framework about san around sanitation needs to be enhanced, clarified, and implemented. So the overall point I want to make is that sanitation is in fact a public good and it has huge benefits across the board, not just for water and sanitation, but health, education, uh, economic development, 
and we need more attention here and we need more more public more efficient public and private money uh to, to provide a sustainable full cost recovery uh sanitation services that we desperately need to make the shortfall in order to reach sdg6 around universal access so that's that's the bot that's the overarching point i wanted to make chris but there's a lot of details to unpack here thanks chris can i jump in i i, I want to give it a, a different uh, maybe a counterpoint to what Joel has said and thinking about it from the point of view of what I've been doing as the head of origination for an impact investment fund where we're looking at water and sanitation. I'm going to be totally honest. Anytime that I think about how as an impact investor, I can participate from a sanitation perspective with the utility, I get stuck. I, I look at the numbers and they just don't work. Um, there's not cost recovery. The financial models don't seem to make sense. And even if I look at this over a 20 or 30 year period, it doesn't work. And so there needs to be a, a, a reckoning with the fact that there's not necessarily the opportunities for all flavors of finance to participate in sanitation. Where I have found the opportunities though is in the private sector providers. And I see that somebody's on from Sanivation where we have invested money and it's not necessarily in the provision of the core service, but it's instead thinking from a circular economy perspective, taking fecal sludge and converting that into something where there is a business case or a business model to be made. And so I, I want to want to be clear on, at least from my perspective, it is, it's far more challenging to access commercial or repayable finance for sanitation than it is for water. And I've talked with some of the commercial banks in a number of countries trying to see if I make this investment now, and let's say it's proof of concept or a pilot that's scaling up, will you be interested once it gets to a certain scale? And even at scale, there's a, a real resistance to investing into business models around sanitation. And so I, I, I don't want anybody to, to leave this session in 15 minutes and say, oh, we have an answer of how we fund our sanitation solutions, because I think that it's going to be far more challenging. And I think that the DFIs do play an important role. Um, but I question whether or not there's that full suite of flavors of finance for sanitation there is for water. Uh, just my opinion, thanks. Look at what happened in the North. Look at what happened in the North. I mean, the, the sanitation systems were heavily subsidized by the state. I think to assume that people who are living on five dollars a day or less can pay for their own sanitation systems is it's a bit you know it's, it's a bit uh, you know unrealistic that said i know next to nothing about sanitation so that's all i'll say <laughs> so uh can i just jump in um i certainly didn't mean to give the impression that this is something that the private sector could fully fund or that it's easy for them to fund i mean the general perception out there is people don't want to pay for sanitation, right? We see the issues and the health implications of open defecation. But uh, Jeremy, I, you know, take a look at Bangladesh. In a 10-year period, they went from almost 90% open defecation to less than 10%. And they did it on the back of microfinance. Now, is that model replicable everywhere? Absolutely not. Nor is it, it nor is my, my thesis that it should be replicated everywhere. But there is one example where, in fact, at the household level, uh, commercial finance has helped with sanitation. I think a couple of points. Number one, back to the subsidy. You're absolutely right. Someone also pointed out the convergence study looking at blending around finance, which I think is absolutely needed and important. I have to bring the public resources into this. But I also fear sometimes that we generally treat sanitation secondary, not because it's not needed or we don't understand it, but because exactly the point you're making, Jeremy, it's hard, can't be funded, so let's leave it to the public sector and just move on. Well, for 100 years, that hasn't been happening and we can't do that anymore. So we have to figure out a way to demystify this, uh, to, to put more attention on it, to get more investment on it, and I go back to the very first point I made. The way to do that is to identify the service we're trying to provide. Uh, and we need the full breadth from a wastewater treatment plant to a household toilet and everything in between. And then we need to figure out a way to finance it and 
maintain it. They're both uh, huge issues, including with private resources, and then look at how private sector finance can, can come in and supplement that over time. Um, so it's a very complex issue. I certainly agree, but we can no longer put it off and we have to absolutely address it. So I hope that clarifies the points I was trying to make. That's a great discussion, and I hope uh, you know maybe in a future uh, session, maybe we can do a whole focus on uh, on sanitation, uh, at both uh, planning value chain and uh, and paying for it. The now, can I just say a couple of words about subsidies? Please? Okay, let's so hear. again, here technology can help. If you're dealing with digital payments being made by subscribers for a water service, then that means that anybody who is willing to make a digital payment from anywhere in the world can make a digital payment on behalf of that person. And so for example, you could say that the thousand poorest households in a city are gonna get a $10 subsidy on their water meter. And that, you know, since they're not spending that money to get water, they'll be able to use that money to buy their, um, their, their sanitation uh, solution, uh, whichever way you want to you know, package that. Again, I don't know very much about sanitation. So the advantage of doing that is that the money goes directly towards an efficient use in the first place. It's in fact, indirectly subsidizing the water utility with ad advanced revenue, and it's subsidizing the household in order by avoiding them having to spend money on water and uh, and it liber and basically freeing rev uh, income that they can use for paying for something else. Now, obviously, this is something that we can do at City Taps. We've not done it yet. Otherwise, I, you know, I uh, maybe wouldn't have come up with the idea. But I want to emphasize the fact that throughout all these problems, every time I go to a conference where we talk about financing, there's a lot of emph emphasis on finance, and it's not surprising because we're talking about finance. But I think that it's hard to imagine for me that City Tops is the only company that has technology solutions that can help smooth the flow of money, open the floodgates of money into the sector. And so I'm sure there are other innovators out there and I encourage them to make themselves known so that we can, in fact, have more money flow into the sector because it's, it's badly needed. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, just very briefly to... as well. Uh, just, oh, just Rich, very please, briefly. please. Go it's a hot topic. Um, just, just very briefly. So, um, you know, I agree with many of the points that were raised. Uh, I, I think that um, there are good, credible examples of subsidies um, designed effectively, and some that have not been designed uh, very effectively, and that that design element is important. I think the World Bank reports an excellent example where you, you could look for uh, cases. Um, in the area of microfinance, as it relates to uh, uh, you know toilets, um, you know, Water.org has reached about 35 million people, mostly through microfinance solutions across the world. 60% uh, of those um, uh, have been in sanitation. So I think that that indicates that there is strong and ongoing demand for um, financing uh, sanitation opportunities at the household level. As as mentioned, it's not. It's not the solution, it's not the silver bullet, um, and it can be utilized in combination with well-designed subsidies. So if you think about the Swatch Bharat mission in India, um, there were subsidies that were provided there, but those often did not cover the full cost of households um, obtaining uh, reliable toilets and services. So that's where a combination of subsidies and some financing can, can really help. Thanks. Hey. hey. All right, so first of all, for the audience, uh, we've got a, a long list of great questions coming in from all of you, and it, we're not going to be able to get to them in, in time. This conversation has been too, uh, too engaging, but what Rock Blue commits to is responding to all of these comments in writing. They will be put up uh, on rockblue.org along with the recording of this event. And uh, so please continue to use the Q&A function to ask specific questions and uh, we, we do commit to getting back to you. But to wrap things up, uh, or as a final question, I wanna change tack slightly. We've talked a lot about demand and uh, uh, the demand side. Now from the supply side, I'm a lender. 
why am I interested in lending to water utilities in the developing world who have poor credit ratings, bad looking accounts, or, or a long, uh, a long um, list of accounts payable? Um, you know, is there reliable cash revenue? And, and you know, what's my motivation for investing in this sector? I'm rolling up several questions here uh, that were addressed to, to different people, but instead I want to open this up. Uh, there's one other question related to this. If I'm a commercial lender and I typically target a ticket size, maybe five to 10 million US, but so many investments in this sector seem to be a lot smaller uh, than that, especially with, uh, with smaller utilities. It, how can I how can I structure things, or where can I look for investments that meet my needs as an investor? Uh, let's. Uh, uh, I'll go through. Uh, Jeremy, you were kicking off on this uh, on, on my question list. Sure. So, and it's a really good question, and and uh, this is not something which is unique to the water sector. I would say, if you are already committed to the water sector and are educated in the water sector. Uh, as far as opportunities and, and want to spend the time and the money, then I think that it's not necessarily the most difficult argument to say, let's look at other economies. Again, thinking back to what Joel said very early on in this session about the currency question, I think there needs to be an understanding of the fact that we're talking developing country context and the revenue flows that will come in the form of the tariffs that are being paid will be in local currency. So there needs to be the appetite for wanting to number one, participate in the water sector, number two, to invest or lend into emerging markets. If you can overcome all of that, and if you are a utility that can demonstrate your credit worthiness and that have bankable projects that are well articulated, I think that there would be far more banks that would be interested, but I think that it also comes back to something else that I said earlier, which is that question of the credit worthiness and credit enhancement. I saw that there was a question on credit enhancements in here as well. So I just, I think of what, for example, the uh, Development Credit Authority within USAID used to be able to do before the DCA function got passed over to the DFC, and they would provide portfolio guarantees to, um, or the opportunity for financial institutions, often domestic commercial banks, to lend to many of the utilities who are on this call. And the reason why that worked particularly well is because there was the credit worthiness of the US government that was effectively helping to de-risk what these opportunities were for investment. And at the same time, the financial institution was doing its own due diligence to make sure all of this works. So I feel like if we can get the ecosystem to be correct, and if we can have all of these things and wave every magic wand, which I know is, is highly unlikely and it sounds naive to say this, but if we see that credit worthiness, we see the bankability and we put that credit enhancement or that guarantee on top of everything else. And we can show that investing in water or lending to water utilities is a better return. And again, if the risk return profile works, so your returns look good as a financial institution, and your risk is mitigated in large part, I do think that, that this is not an impossibility. The question as far as size of transactions, that is a problem. And if you're a financial institution, your cost of originating a transaction will roughly be the same, whether we're talking a $100,000, a $1 million, or a $100 million transaction. And so we do need to make sure that we don't lose sight of those different pieces, but I, I guess I'll close with my comment that I don't think that it's impossible to see that water utilities and water service providers and those that are service providers to water utilities will find it impossible to access money if they can articulate what they're doing in a way which is reasonable. And if we're talking about domestic financial institutions that are prepared to not be forcing the borrower to take on currency risk. Uh, but there are so many pieces to that and I feel like I might have done myself and everybody else on this call a disservice by glossing over some of those important intricacies. Chris, back to you. Thanks, Jeremy. If nobody else is jumping in. I, I am aware that we're bumping up against the end of our of our time here. Uh, Gregor, uh, quickly. I'll jump in if, uh, if you know if if uh, lending institution. Um, 
So we have found lending institutions who are willing to take that risk because they are being convinced that our, that technology can help them reduce the risk that they have historically perceived, okay? On small tickets, mind you, definitely not investing $100 million into a, a water utility, um, but on small tickets for now, and then with the objective, because they're not interested in doing $100,000 tickets forever, they're interested in doing much bigger tickets, but they are willing, in fact, to, to move forward. So if you're one of those lenders, if, if you're one of those people that's thinking, you know, I really want to enter this field and I haven't found a, a segue into this for now, by all means, you can reach out to me. I will happy to discuss it with you. I'm happy to show you what I've been discussing with other investors. Um, there's more than enough room in this in this sector uh, for uh, multiple investors to 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 uh, to intervene, and you have to be a little bit creative. You have to be willing to think a little bit outside the box, uh, not too far, but just a little bit. And uh, and you know we we found that investors who have invested in the solar pago um, sector are actually primed for entering the water sector, but they haven't found a way to up until we've met them found a way to make their experience uh, work. So. That, you know, if you look at it from a purely financial point of view, you're going to run against the same problems that Jeremy keeps talking about, and he's absolutely 100% right. But, you know, just banging your head against that wall isn't going to get us anywhere closer to SG6, which is why we've proposed, you know, a small door at the very bottom of the door of the wall that maybe we can start sliding through and build, as we move forward, build the credit worthiness of the utility and hopefully take down the wall. Joel and Rich, I had it in my notes uh, to ask you around that question of packaging uh, uh, smaller ticket items uh, and in particular your water equity uh, model. Uh, would one of you like to speak to that quickly? Uh, I'll offer two quick comments because I know you. I, I know we want to wrap up. Um, so first comment um, is that uh, Yes, there can be challenges in terms of aligning ticket sizes with investor needs. Um, that said, I think um, domestic financial institutions in many cases um, can, can be a venue uh, to invest. Um, so I'm talking beyond microfinance. So I'm talking more at the you know, $10,000 level, $100,000 level, um, et cetera. Um, there have been a couple examples of effective partnerships in Cambodia and Indonesia that we've been building between local financial institutions and, uh, and utilities and private uh, water operators, uh, public and private water operators, um, that um, we are looking for ways to continue to scale up. Um, and then uh, on the water equity side, right. So uh, water equity, it's an impact investment firm. It's solely focused on water and sanitation. Uh, we have about 160 million in assets under management. That's been raised in five years. Um, most many of those investments have gone into domestic financial institutions, but we're also actively exploring and investing in a few wash enterprises, and we want to do more in that area as well as the wash and infrastructure space. So, um, stay tuned. I guess I would say uh, to, to close things up. Joel, any final comments? Look, I know we got to go. Um, I endorse everything everyone said. I think there there are opportunities at the at the smaller level. Someone mentioned uh, vendor supplier finance. I'd mentioned that earlier as a way to get it. Also, there was a question earlier about revolving funds. Revolving funds have the opportunity to do smaller amount, uh, to provide smaller financing as well. The money itself is not generally not our problem. It's getting to credit worthiness, which is the challenge. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. No, I think that message resonates. That ends uh, our panel discussion today, and I'd like to thank all of uh, the participants for joining us today. Um, I want to say if you've enjoyed our online lecture series and uh, these panel discussions and would like, a, like to help us and support us to put on more, please consider uh, making a donation on our website at rockblue.org. Uh, in any case, check out our, our website and see how uh, you can get involved. Also, please help us improve our future webinars by uh, completing the questionnaire that'll follow uh, when you close out or when you leave this meeting. Now, one thing I want to touch on before we can before I conclude uh, here, I'd really like to address an important issue. Over our past eight webinars, uh, we've managed to have forty five percent representation by uh, by women experts and thirty three percent by people of co of color. 
we dropped the ball in our planning of this one. We've got a, an incredible panel here, but I honestly believe that the the uh, the the insights and the discussion would have been so much richer if we could have had uh, better uh, diversity and inclusion, and including uh, some some uh, of our experts and our specialists from the utilities and, and from the countries that we're actually trying to assist that could give us the on the ground perspective. We will do better. And uh, that's a commitment from me, a commitment that's reflected by the senior management of, uh, of Rock Blue. Please bear with us and help us to do better. Continue to challenge us and uh, we will continue to respond to your needs. Um, with, with that, I'd like to hand off to, uh, to Peter for some closing remarks. Uh, Chris, thank you for those comments, uh, with, especially with regards to diversity. And I echo what you said about panelists. Jeremy, you, Joel, Rich, Gregoire, you, you added a lot of great content and knowledge. This, is, this, this webinar has been recorded. So others are gonna benefit from this as well. I really appreciate your time, uh, the two hours that you gave to this, the, the time you spent preparing, um, and of course, all the service you've all given to the wash sector in your careers. So thank you for that. Um, Jeremy, you did mention some of the work that Rock Blue is doing with regards to finance. Uh, we have started up a new initiative called the ACORN Initiative, thanks for Mentioning that this is helping utilities get access to capital finance, and we're just getting that kickstarted. So we hope that more utilities can tap into that initiative of Rock Blue. Anyway, uh, thank you all to the attendees as well, the time you spent, the great questions you had. Uh, we will get those answered. That will be part of the recording that goes up on the website. Everyone have a wonderful day, stay safe. And we'll see you at the next uh, online lecture series. Thank you all. All the Thanks best. Thanks very Thanks much. Bye-bye.